The video was haunting. Captured by the drones of the occupying forces, it showed the exact moment when Yahya Sinwar, the political leader of the Palestinian resistance, fought for his life before he was ultimately killed. For many viewers across the globe, this footage presented a stark contrast to the narrative pushed by the occupiers. They had described Sinwar as a man hiding deep within tunnels, far from the front lines, supposedly surrounded by hostages and explosives. But this video shattered that image. Here he was, dressed in combat gear, clearly on the front line, allegedly fighting for the liberation of the Palestinian people. The fact that there wasn't widespread global coverage of Sinwar's death spoke volumes. It suggested that the world may be growing more sympathetic to the Palestinians and their struggle for freedom from occupation. In Israel, too, the expected jubilation was notably absent. The grand celebration one might expect, following the death of someone the occupation government under Benjamin Netanyahu had labeled the greatest terrorist of all time, simply didn't happen. I'm even more scared now that we won't get anybody back. Why is that? Because they have no reason and, and revenge. The elimination of Sinwar seemed unrelated to the pressing issue of over 100 Israeli prisoners who remain in Palestinian custody, hidden in underground jails. The ongoing failure to secure their release has led many to question whether the assassination of resistance leaders from Gaza to Lebanon has done anything other than inflate the ego of the occupation forces. أن يستفرد بالمسجد الأقصى وبالقدس وبأهلنا في الشيخ جراح وأن يستمر في سياسته التي تخالف القانون الدولي وتخالف القرارات الدولية في القدس وفي الضفة الغربية بالاستيطان ومصادرة الأراضي وباستمرار الحصار ضد أهلنا وضدنا في قطاع غزة وباستمرار سياسات الفصل العنصري والتمييز العنصري ضد أهلنا في داخل الأراضي المحتلة عام 48 ضد وأهلنا في في الداخل هو الذي سيحدد شكل المستقبل القريب إن شاء الله رب العالمين. So the war isn't completely over. وهذه يعني احنا الصراع اللي بيننا وبين الاحتلال اللي اغتصب ارضنا وهجر اهلنا ولا زال يمارس القتل والتشريد ومصادره الاراضي والاعتداء على المقدسات معركه مفتوحه معركه مفتوحه احنا مقتنعين قناعه يقينيه بانه نحن لا نريد الحرب ولا نريد القتال لانه كلفته باهظه وشعبنا احنا في غنى عن 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 مثل هذه المواجهات وهذه الحروب إحنا في فترات طويلة لجأنا إلى أساليب المقاومة الشعبية السلمية والمقاومة الشعبية وللأسف الشديد جدا كنا نعتقد بأنه العالم والدول العالم والشعوب الحرة والمنظومات الدولية تقف إلى جانب شعبنا وتكبح الاحتلال من أن يرتكب جرائم ومجازر ضد شعبنا لكن للأسف الشديد جدا وقف العالم متفرجا على آلة حرب جيش الاحتلال to many in the West, Yahya Sinwar is portrayed as a monster, a symbol of terror. But his life story tells a more nuanced tale, one of resistance born from years of injustice and colonialism. His decision to join the Palestinian resistance was deeply rooted in his experiences under occupation, fueled by the anger of generational oppression orchestrated by European settlers who claimed to be the rightful owners of Palestinian land. Sinwar is best known as the mastermind behind some of the most deadly Palestinian resistance attacks on what is now occupied Palestine. However, little is understood about his personal motivations, his rise to power, or how he became one of the most wanted figures in the region. Who exactly was Yahya Sinwar? What ideology drove him, and how did he evolve into a central figure in the Palestinian resistance? Before delving into the details of his life, it's important to clarify that at OMT News, we do not condone violence as a means to resolve disputes. We firmly believe that diplomacy is the ultimate path to addressing grievances between opposing sides.
With that said, the occupation government wasted no time reveling in the news of Sinwar's death. Netanyahu quickly appeared on national television, reading from his teleprompter to announce the leader's demise. Yet there was a noticeable shift in the tone of his message. Only weeks earlier, Netanyahu had labeled Sinwar a coward, claiming he was hiding in a tunnel with hostages, evading capture or death. But the video evidence now circulating contradicted that narrative. There was no denying the image of Sinwar fighting and dying on the front line. Even the IDF spokesperson, who appeared on a prominent news channel, struggled to maintain the portrayal of Sinwar as a coward who had been hiding behind prisoners of war. Look, I'll, I'll tell you how I look at it. This mission is not over. Okay. Yes, of course, it's a significant achievement, uh, but the mission is, is ongoing. And that's why the Prime Minister said last night that our highest priority, nothing higher, is getting out our 101 hostages still being yeah. held by Hamas. 36 yeah. of them, unfortunately, have been killed uh, by Hamas. Some of them were killed on October the 7th and their bodies were taken by UN staff, United Nations staff, into yeah. uh, Gaza. But the mission will not be over until we bring all of our hostages home and dismantle Hamas's rule in Gaza. But we have brought that close. Despite Sinwar's death, well, hopes for an easy prisoner swap between Israel region. and there the Palestinian peace. resistance dimmed further today. If with head, his head held high. The resistance movement, in confirming their leader's death, dashed any remaining optimism within the occupation government that his demise might lead to a breakthrough in negotiations for the release of the 101 Israeli prisoners still detained in Gaza. The resistance made it clear that no prisoners would be released until the war ended and the occupation forces fully withdrew from Gaza. This unyielding stance was exactly what political commentators like Alexander Mercouris and Alex Christofferou had predicted. They had foreseen that Sinwar's death in combat wouldn't weaken the Palestinian resolve, but would instead harden their determination. Well, well I think the first thing I'm going to say is that I, I'm not sure I would describe it as an assassination because the Israelis have released a film, which perhaps they might have been wiser from their point of view not to do, which shows him dying in battle, fighting the Israelis, being um, very you know, brave and resolute in defending himself against heavy odds. So, of course, lots of people who, um, you know, are part of his movement are going to be inspired by this. I I'm not sure why the Israelis did that. I think this was a mistake. Now, my own view is very simple. Israel is got itself into a hole. It is fighting in Gaza. It is fighting in South Lebanon. Its economy is tanking. Large numbers of people are leaving Israel. Um, it's being drawn or is pushing itself rather into a conflict with Iran, where Iran has demonstrated that it has the capability to strike anywhere that it wishes within Israel and its missiles get through. What the Israelis should do is that they built up Sinwar. They made him into this a terrifying figure that, you know, people in Israel believe that he is. They can now say if they are clever, the Israelis are clever and wise, that his mission accomplished, that they killed this man. And now they can stop. They can agree a ceasefire in Gaza. They can agree a ceasefire in South Lebanon. They can call off the war with Iran. They can do all of, all of these things and tell themselves and the world that they've come out ahead. Of course, they are not going to do that. They're going to plunge on. They're going to continue the war with all of the enormous problems that they're bringing on to themselves and all the devastation and misery that they're creating throughout the region. And when they do that, well, I've already said that Sinwa came across looking as a courageous fighter, defending himself is going to be an inspiration for more people and for every sinwa there will be 10 others yeah I'll, I'll i'll agree with what alexander said um I, i'm having a hard time understanding why they they released this video uh, they could have they could have just come out with a statement 
maybe release some photos and and that would have been uh more than enough to to confirm his his death um it does look like all the indications are that uh, that Netanyahu is going to to continue the the war and uh, he there is the opportunity that he could end things but uh, we're getting reports now from from a lot of media outlets including outlets like Reuters which are they are saying that Netanyahu is going to to press on and press on all the way to to war with Iran you know, I, I 100% agree with you guys. It makes no sense as to why they released that. They, they Frankly, they made Sinwar look uh, just as badass as he really was in his final uh, last moments. You know, his arm was hanging off from what I could see in the video, and he's still fending off uh, all these various attacks. I mean, it, it was something like out of a movie. It was incredible. Um, but the the... The practical implications are important here. Hezbollah has said that they're going to escalate uh, the conflict against Israel. What that means, we don't really know. Um, And then you have the question of Iran as well. Uh, How does Israel find an off-ramp here? Uh, Alexander, you mentioned the idea of just calling it off, but that leaves the question of the hostages. Um, Hamas in the past has said they would give the hostages back at this point if a ceasefire is agreed to. Uh, But I think there's also a lot of people who feel like that this cannot end without a Palestinian state in some way, shape, or form, two state, one state, whatever it is. So where where does Netanyahu go here, uh, from here? He's in a he's in a political mess as far as I'm concerned. Well, in my opinion, the Israelis have just been offered an off ramp and they're not going to take it because what they want to do instead, or at least what Netanyahu and his team want, is they want to escalate. I mean, they could get a ceasefire in Gaza. They could get the hostages released. They could agree to negotiations. Of course, they would be negotiations which they might not be happy about the outcome. But we've seen that Israel has never up to now been put under any real pressure by the Western powers in any negotiation process. So maybe they shouldn't fear negotiations. But the fact is, what the Israeli government wants to do, what Netanyahu wants to do, what the people around him want to do, is they want to pursue a war. They want to destroy Hezbollah. They want to destroy uh, Hamas. They want to reoccupy parts of Gaza or all of Gaza. Now they're talking about it quite openly. And of course, above all, first and foremost, most importantly, they want the war with Iran because they think if they can defeat Iran and achieve regime change there, then that will enable them to restructure the whole of the Middle East in the way that they want. It is, in my opinion, completely delusional. It is taking Israel further down the path to its own ultimate defeat, but that is what they're going to do. Far from treating this as an opportunity for an off-ramp, they're going to be encouraged and incited by this death of Sinwar, by this absolutely, you know, correctly said, he died fighting this death of Sinwar. They're going to see that as another opportunity to escalate even more. And as for Hezbollah and what it could do, well, there was an article just the other day in the Financial Times in which an Israeli official, an actual Israeli official, was saying that up to now Hezbollah has only used a fraction of its rockets and missiles. It has been carrying out rocket and missile strikes on Israel, but it could carry out strikes on a regular basis that are far more powerful than those it has done up to now. So it has plenty of space in which to escalate if it chooses to do so. And that is quite probably what we're now going to see. Yeah, this is this has been perhaps the final off ramp for uh, for yeah. a conflict with Iran. If uh, Netanyahu were to take it, um, I, th- I think it's clear that at least at the moment he's not going to take it, and he's going to escalate to to the war with Iran. Maybe there's a final opportunity to to de escalate after the election if Trump wins. I know I'm going to get pushback for for saying this, 
but um, I'm, I'm a little bit encouraged by uh, by what Trump said to uh, to uh, Patrick uh, Patrick Ben Davis about Iran, where he was asked about regime change in Iran, and and Trump seemed that he was very negative towards any type of uh, regime change in Iran. So maybe maybe there's a there, there's a small opening if Trump wins that perhaps we could try to get some sort of uh, of a de-escalation at least with regards to uh, to conflict with uh, with Iran or or maybe the US getting heavily involved in uh, in a conflict with, in a conflict with Iran but um that's i think that's that's it after the election if if Trump wins and we still don't get any kind of uh, diplomacy or de-escalation then war with Iran is is inevitable and we may get that war before the the elections uh uh, even take place. So we'll see the, the Biden White House, as we have said in many, many videos, uh, and that's Alexander has outlined in great detail, the Biden White House, Biden diplomacy, the State Department, Blinken, they've made a complete mess of uh, of this situation. And, uh, and they handed Netanyahu a blank check, and he has been cashing in those blank checks uh, for the past year. In the end, the death of Yahya Sinwar seems unlikely to bring the swift resolution to the conflict that some in Israel may have hoped for. Instead, it highlights the deep-rooted complexity of the Palestinian struggle, where every assassination, every act of violence only seems to fuel further resistance. While Sinwar is gone, the broader movement for Palestinian liberation continues, and the challenges facing both sides remain as intractable as ever. Yahya Sinwar was a prominent Palestinian political and military leader who served as the head of the Palestinian resistance in the Gaza Strip. He was a key figure within the organization's leadership, often regarded as one of the most powerful individuals in Gaza due to his influence over both the political and military wings of the Palestinian resistance. Sinwar was born in the Khan Yunis refugee camp in Gaza in 1962, and he grew up under Israeli occupation. Zinwar had a long history of involvement with the Palestinian resistance, which he co-founded in the late 1980s as the group emerged from the Muslim Brotherhood. He played a significant role in organizing its militant operations during the First Intifada, the Palestinian uprising against Israeli rule, and was responsible for security and intelligence operations for the Palestinian resistance. In 1989, Sinwar was arrested by Israel and sentenced to multiple life terms for his involvement in the killing of two Israeli soldiers. He remained imprisoned until 2011, when he was released as part of a prisoner exchange deal that freed Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit. His release and subsequent rise to power made him a central figure in the military leadership of the Palestinian resistance especially after he was elected head of the group in Gaza in 2017. Sinwar had a reputation for being a hardliner, supporting armed resistance against Israel. He was also seen as a strategist who shaped the Palestinian resistance's military tactics and policies. Under his leadership, the group focused on both strengthening its military capabilities and navigating political challenges in the Gaza Strip where it maintained de facto control since 2007. He was a central figure in multiple conflicts with Israel, including the 2021 and 2023 Gaza-Israel conflict, and his leadership played a crucial role in shaping the Palestinian resistance's approach to the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict until his death.